extensively in French and English. Uh, he's currently working on a Penguin history of modern Vietnam, which should be out soon, I think 2015. That's the I think that's, that's, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And three years ago, he has actually published this book here, Vietnam, which is the basis of his talk today, and which is supposed to be out, as I think Cornell at one point in, in the future. Please uh, await announcements. Um, he also talk, uh, this talk today is an attempt of SIPS to expand the notion of peace and security away from traditional ideas and away from political science into history. So um, we try now to do that here too. Uh, before we start with the talk, uh, I just Chris told me that I should announce that uh, if, uh, some propaganda. Vistra yep. <laughs> uh, has published actually a special issue on Vietnam uh, in the last 2,000 years, which can be sold in every, every good, good news, sto uh, uh, news store here in, in Montreal. And I think we just start um, maybe 55 minutes, uh, 45 minutes, and you know, then we have a sure. day session and then we'll have that. Great. Well, well, thank you, you Lorenz. Um, thank you, Jay. Thank you. My thanks to the center for having me here today, um, and thank you all for being here. So um, I am going to try to talk about, actually, it's, it's one of my chapters in my French book, uh, Vietnam, a, a State of War. That's the title of, the, of it, in, if I translate it from French into English, and, and I think that's what I'm going to try to go for. So you find that title here in my talk here. This comes from one of the chapters where I try to develop my argument, one of the main arguments in my book, one of, one of several, uh, about State of War, an état de guerre. Uh, and so my idea here is to uh, play with the idea of total, total state of war. And I'm going it's, to, it's in parentheses, uh, so I'm going to, so I'm going to try to give you a little bit of an explanation, a theoretical explanation uh, of what I'm trying to do with the idea of uh, a total state of war. Of course, as you can see here in my title, uh, I'm going to use as my case study communist Vietnam. I'm going, and I'll, I'll talk more about it in a moment. Uh, and it's going to be Communist Vietnam and the war, which is going to be of interest to us uh, this morning, this afternoon, is the Indochina War. So the one between 1945 and 1954. But I am, this, and I'm taking advantage of this, so feel free to criticize me, please. Because um, I want to take advantage of your critiques, not only for the, the English version of the book, but I'm going to expand this all the way to 1975. And I'm going to try to see what happens during the American period. Uh, on the communist Vietnamese side and on the other Vietnamese sides as well. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit more info on that. I'm not going to just you know, launch into it. I'll try to develop my argument as I go along. Uh, so, yeah, it's so coming out of my book, but I want to go with it in a new direction all the way to 1975, when, of course, the Americans, well, in 1954, 54, are going to replace the French. And they are going to unleash what I think is one of the most asymmetrical wars that we've seen in the 20th century. But at the same time, this Vietnamese communist state is going to try to take the war, not just a guerrilla war. They're going to try to take a conventional war to the Americans as well. And this is central to my argument. But in more of a, what, what uh, this, this was captured by French troops after one of the battles. This, we don't know exactly when this battle took place, but it has to be sometime around 1951 or 1952. And this really gets at, I mean, an image. I think it's important, but I want to try to get a total state of war. I want to see, I want to see how it impacted upon people. I want to see how it impacted upon civilians. I want to, and I'll explain this more in my introduction, but I want to see how this collapse broke down the distinction between civilians and combatants on the other, uh, on the other hand. So this picture, I mean, this, 
And I'm going to finish with this picture at the end of my talk in about 35 or 40 minutes. But this picture captures well the massive mobilization which took place, in particular from 1915, which is going to go all the way to 1954 at the Indian Pool, but it's going to go all the way to 1975. So that's the title. This perhaps you can situate the human side of it that I'm going to try to, to weave into my talk today, in particular at the end, uh, because I want to understand what the, not only what a total, I'll come back to this idea, but I want to understand what it meant to experience this type of war for Vietnamese civilians, uh, in particular uh, in the countryside. Now, scholars have spilled a lot of ink over the question and the nature of total war. Total war in the West, ranging from the French Revolutionary Wars of the late 18th century, early 19th century, to the World Wars, and in particular the First and Second World, War, World Wars uh, of the 20th century. Few, however, have considered the extent to which colonial wars occurring in the global south, if I can put it that way, the non-Western world, also gave, rise, also gave rise to remarkably totalizing conflicts. Hugh Strand, a British historian, made just such a point in a very incisive essay that he published about 10 years ago entitled On Total War and Modern War. A Canadian historian of Quebecois, Talbot Imlay, seconded him more recently in an equally insightful and critical discussion of the concept of total war. Both these scholars suggest that because insurgencies, guerrilla wars, <coughs> excuse me, lacked modern weapons, modern weapons industries, armaments, and regular conventional armies equal to those of their industrialized Western uh, opponents, the guerrilla leaders, the insurgent leaders, had therefore obviously little choice but to intensify their reliance on the surrounding geography, <coughs> excuse me, resources, peoples, and animals. Developed Western states fighting such asymmetrical conflicts, for example, in wars of decolonization of the 20th century, never had to put their home fronts and their civilians on the same war footing. It's obvious. Liberation movements such as the Front de Libération Nationale in Algeria, the Viet Minh, or the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, what we'll see in a minute in Vietnam, did from the start to the finish. And in so doing, these guerrilla states, these insurgent states, rapidly blurred the distinction between civilians and combatants, which is the core definition of total war. So I'm going to submit that this is at least one definition that we have to keep in mind. I'm going to come back to other definitions which have been uh, suggested. But at least one total war is the breakdown, the blurring, the collapse of that distinction. It's what some, like Martin Thomas and Andrew Barros are now calling the civilianization of war. Now, scholars know that no war is ever told. And I know that's true. I would, however, like to use Strand's and Imley's insights into the unequal nature of wars of decolonization in the non-Western world <coughs> in order to argue that the DRV, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, the Viet Minh, if you like, initiated from 1950 initiated from 1950, not 1954, from 1950, initiated what became one of the most totalizing wars in the history of 20th century decolonization, profoundly transforming the state and the society, the people it sought to create the state and mobilize the people. However, and this is important, rather than insisting that Gauche's war, my war, is a total war, as David Bell has done for the French Revolutionary Wars, a slew of American history historians have done for the Civil Wars, more and more historians have done for the First, in particular in France, and the Second World Wars, and increasingly in my field, we're now referring to the Vietnam Wars as total wars. I use the term total today as a heuristic device. In fact, I prefer the term totalizing 
as a way of getting at how the changing nature of the Indochina War increasingly mobilized, touched, controlled, and moved civilians. I'm not trying to say, therefore, that the Indochina War was a total war because it mobilized everyone. That's one other definition of total war. It mobilized everyone. That's what people say. It mobilized everyone. Because my war did not mobilize everyone. And I'm not sure that any war does. We can come back to that. But at least we need to be careful in how we define these terms. So mobilizing everyone, that's not quite what I'm saying. But there's a bunch of mobilization that's going to go on. But I'm not saying that it mobilized everyone. It's more in northern Vietnam and in central Vietnam, for reasons which I'll explain to you in a moment. Nor am I saying that it mobilized everything. Or that it was just total violence everywhere. Kill everything that moves. No, that's not what I'm after. That's not what I'm going after in this definition of a totalizing war. I'm trying to understand, again, how that distinction between combatants and civilians breaks down, how this increasingly modern type of war, I'm going to explain myself next in the next part, led to an increasing civil civilianization of the war in much greater ways than it ever, ever did for the French side. I'm also hoping, I'm also hoping that this approach, and feel free to, to, to smack me around a little bit, but I'm hoping that this approach might allow us to develop comparisons with other wars of decolonization in the 20th century, including, or at least also other wars of decolonization in the 20th century, and would allow us to think about those very asymmetrical ones occurring as we speak, and even, and my French colleagues don't like this, even to think about how, if we had certain ways of defining wars, civilianization, totalizing ways, and I'm going to give you ways that I'm measuring this, that might allow us even to compare them to the so-called total wars of the First World War. In other words, can we cross the divide not only throughout the, the different types of wars in the non-Western decolonizing world, or these type of wars that are going on today, we can come back to that in the discussion, but also, can we compare what's going on in the Indochina War and the Vietnam War after it to what was going on in the Soviet Union uh, during the Second World War, in terms of how I'm defining this, totally, this total state of war? Quick word, as I move into my argument, here's the French Empire, Indochina, for those of you maybe, which is totally understandable. Uh, colonized at the end of the 19th century. Here, part of a wider, this is 18th and 19th century, right? We're not going to worry about what's going on over here. Uh, part of a wider French empire, and this was the so-called Pearl of the East, Hanoi in the north, Saigon in the south, Vietnam on the eastern side, Laos inside, Cambodia here. Those three states uh, constituted the colonial state of French Indochina. Itself part of a bigger empire state, of course, including France. Uh, and North Africa, and I will make reference to uh, Algeria. So do keep in mind that there's going to be a second war, and it's no accident that it occurs during, or right at the end of the Indochina War, that begins in Algeria. And we can come back to that in the discussion, but I will try to make some comparisons as we go along with what's going on, oh, I did it. Uh, <laughs> with what's going on uh, in, in, in Africa, excuse me, in Algeria, with the Liberation Front there, the state that they're going to build in Algeria. Uh, it's going to, I'm going to refer to it obviously as the F, uh, Fond de Libération Nationale, the FLN, FLN. Let me just say a few quick things uh, on the Indochina War, just you know, for folks who, you know, this might not be your thing, that's okay, but it's, it also allows me to develop my argument a little bit more, in particular concerning this first half of the war between 1945 and 1949 1950. The key date for me in my argument is this conjuncture of 1949-1950. But keep in mind that the war broke out between Ho Chi Minh and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam on the one side and the French on the other at the end of 1946. Upon coming to power in September 1945, in the wake of the Allied defeat of the Japanese, Ho Chi Minh grafted, uh, he grafted in Hanoi, he grafted his new nation state onto the pre-existing French colonial state. I won't go into the details, but the Japanese, right before they lost, they overthrew the French. Opened up a vacuum, 
Ho Chi Minh and his folks took over and they created what's called the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, the first independent post-colonial state since the 19th century when Vietnam was colonized and put into this colonial state of which I spoke a moment ago. So he grafted, like all post-colonial states do, or most, uh, he grafted the new nation state onto the pre-existing French colonial one using oftentimes its personnel, and its Vietnamese personnel, its administration, and its infrastructure. Couldn't be otherwise. His government, however, evacuated as much as it could, as much of the colonial state as it could from the cities before the war broke out. They transferred all of this to the north and to the center of Vietnam, where they set up their capital and the jungles. From there, Ho was the president. He continued to administer <coughs> a state and an army. As in Indonesia, as in Algeria, as in other places around the, the global south, the Vietnamese army was, sorry for the French here, the Vietnamese army was weak, badly trained, how could it be otherwise? It was weak, badly trained, badly armed, it had few modern weapons, it had some, but few, uh, compared to the French who were coming back. It fought, therefore, a guerrilla war, relying on local villages for food and support, and only engaged, as you can see in this uh, excerpt that I give you here, only engaged in hit-and-run attacks in order to avoid being blown to bits, and in order to <clears throat> bog down the French as much as possible, the French army, and to force them eventually to say, hey, there's no way we can win this. It's a political problem. This is decolonization. We have to negotiate. Uh, and that was what they were going to do. Things didn't turn out that, I mean, that's what the Vietnamese were hoping they were going to be able to do. Things didn't turn out that way. Neither the French nor the Vietnamese were ready to cede. The war continued. Unlike in Indonesia, uh, the war did not end at that conjuncture of 1949-1950. The nature of the war instead changed dramatically at that time when the Chinese communists took control of China in 1949 and 1950, recognized the DRV diplomatically with the Soviets as well, and began supplying it with modern weapons. That never happened for the FLN in Algeria. It never happened either for the Indonesians. The Cold War now doubled a colonial one in Indochina, and it's in the north. And that's why this war is going to heat up and be particularly dangerous for combatants and for civilians in northern Vietnam and central Vietnam, but it will never be as totalizing in the south. That comes with the Americans. <clears throat> so the Cold War now doubled a colonial one. That photo is post-54. I just kind of tried to put some things together, if you don't mind. Uh, so don't call me on my photos, please. Um, the Americans also stepped in. The idea that the Americans, the, their war began in 19, whatever, 1955, 1959, 1963. No, for me, the American war began in Indochina in 1950, at the same moment that the Chinese became involved in the Indochina war. This is very important because the Americans, <laughs> It's thanks to them that the French are going to be able to hold on and they're not going to negotiate for another four years. But the Americans, they too will provide highly modern, even more modern arms to the French than they ever had before. I mean, the French really weren't looking that well when they came out of World War II. We can come back to that if you like in a moment. But now they will receive some of the most modern arms coming out of the Second World War and coming out of the American war industry. Napalm was first used by the French in Indochina in 1950 in the first set-piece battle against the Vietnamese. It wasn't 51. It started from the beginning in 1950. Napalm. The Americans provided more airplanes. They provided artillery. They provided ships, boats, all sorts of things. Decrypting machines. I can go on and give you all sorts of examples. So you have one of the most modern nations on earth, which is now housed in the French, and you have a less than modern, if I can put it that way, uh, Sino-Soviet bloc that is now helping the Vietnamese. Ho Chi Minh and his party embraced the communist camp. They didn't have little choice, or I also think they wanted to. And I'm not going to argue that point today, but it doesn't matter. That's what happened. Uh, and they welcomed, or at least they were willing to use 
the internationalization of this war and able to win. If not, they're on their own against the Franco-American bloc. Okay, so I mean, we can argue about, you know, did they want it or not, but it doesn't matter to my argument. It happened. It happened. So that's, that's, I mean, that's why. So I don't hope, we, we can talk about it in the discussion if you like, but just I want to make sure that we avoid any ambiguity on that. So this is the point at which the war transforms dramatically. This conjuncture is key to my argument. It gave rise to three interconnected transformations that led to an increasingly totalizing war for the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. So there's three things I want to talk about. The first point, and then my second point will have two corollaries, and then I'll come to my third point. First, in 1949, convinced of Chinese support, Vietnamese communist leaders chose to move from low-intensity guerrilla skirmishes to conventional warfare in order to defeat the colonizer on the battlefield. They maintain guerrilla warfare at the same time. I've never said that they let go of guerrilla warfare. The two now work together. You can see it in Zhap's writings. Vaughn Wen Zhap, the famous General Zhap. You can see the two things go together in their military strategy. As they did in China, I'll come back to that. What did this mean? This meant, it's a little bit on the military side, but it's important for my social architecture. This meant the creation of a divisional army run by a modern general staff and supported by sophisticated intelligence, communications, and medical services. A professional divisional army started to come into being rapidly uh, between 1950 and 1954, and those divisions were first trained, outfitted, and armed in southern China, based on Sino-Soviet models. It also meant obtaining, building, organizing, and dispensing modern military force. Not guns, uh, play guns here, but artillery, anti-aircraft weapons, mines, machine guns, all sorts of things. Thanks to Sino Soviet assistance and the help of hundreds, if not thousands, of Chinese advisors, the DRV began training, equipping, and running six, possibly seven divisions capable of deploying modern firepower and conventional troop attacks. Again, guerrilla warfare continued. But from 1950, Vietnamese communists, like their counterparts in China, like their counterparts in North Korea, like their counterparts in the Soviet Union, transitioned, Soviet Union is a little bit different, let's just say China and North Korea, transitioned to conventional war in order to take the battle to their adversary in set-piece classical battles. Dien Bien Phu was trench warfare. I'm not saying that all eight of the modern battles, I can, I can, I, and I, we can get to them in the discussion, but just, this isn't guerrilla warfare that they're going after. This is set-piece, modern battle. Dien Bien Phu is compared to Verdun. Why? Because both sides used artillery. That's why. So this was a military revolution, I, I submit to you today. This was a military revolution that took place in a full-blown war of decolonization. Did it come into being, boom, just like that in 1950 and 51? No. Did it have all sorts of problems? I'm going to talk to you about it right now. But what's interesting is that we have a transition, a desire, <laughs> and a social desire behind it, uh, to, to mobilize, I mean, uh, to make this transition. That brings me, then, therefore, to my second point. My second point is this. Although General Vaughan Nguyen Zapp's victory over the French at Dien Bien Phu in 54 demonstrated, I think we can say that, that the Viet Minh could fight a modern set-piece battle and win. They came close to losing that battle. I'm going to show you in a minute. The deployable level of modern lethal violence remained uneven. 
I'm trying to avoid jargon here, but this is important. They transition to conventional warfare, but what I'm saying is that the deployable, the ability to use it huh, and to have the same equal amount of killing force uh, that you can throw at the other side remained unequal. It remained unequal. There's a tendency in the in historiography to say, wow, the Vietnamese, they, they defeated the French. Well, it's slightly more complicated. It's slightly more complicated because they almost lost. So this is really important for what I want to say here, is that yes, they wanted Yen Bien Phu, and it is amazing. But the deployable levels of modern lethal violence remained uneven. The communist bloc, yes, it's true, provided the DRV with modern weapons such as artillery, anti-aircraft batteries, grenades, machine guns, and all sorts of weapons that, they're, that they're, uh, they're, they're carrying up there. However, the Viet Minh, and this is key, the DRV, Ho Chi Minh's war state, never fielded tanks, napalm, planes, a navy, and this is it nor did they deploy a fully mechanized transport and logistical system. No trucks until the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. I know this is a lot of military speak here, but I think you can see where I'm going with this. They didn't have a mechanized, modern, industrial, they had the weapons, but they didn't have the transport system that they needed to take the war across all of northern Indochina into Laos, into central Vietnam, conceivably even into Cambodia and into southern Vietnam. Do you see what I'm saying here? Uh, whereas the French did. The French, it's, it's a problem for the French as well. I'm going to get to that in a minute as well. Their artillery never matched that of the French, nor did the DRV regular army enjoy the advantage of numbers. The DRV was not China. Total population in Vietnam in 1945 was 20 million. If we look at just the DRV, the state that they, the territory they controlled, they had 10 million people. Of those 10 million people in the state of the DRV, 7 million were in central and northern Vietnam. This isn't China. They don't have a lot of people. And Vong Nguyen Zhap talks about this problem uh, in his, uh, his documents and in his memoirs. The DRV, therefore, was not China. That's what I mean. The French had the French Union Army. It wasn't. French boys, it came from the colonies. That's very important. The French Union Army was a modern army run by French officers, but it relied upon the manpower, mainly poor people from other parts of the colonies, to do the fighting. And I can give you statistics if you want. That's the enemy army, but that's not the only army. The French create a counter-revolutionary state, the associated state of Vietnam, the state of Bao Dai, if you like, as much as I don't like that expression, uh, to, to fight against Ho Chi Minh state. From 1950, even a little bit before, the Americans step in, through the French, they transform this army into <coughs> a regular army at the same moment that the DRV is transforming its army into a conventional army. Therefore, you have three conventional armies at war in northern and central Vietnam. Therefore, in terms of size and in terms of deployable modern firepower, even the numbers of arms, the DRV remained at a disadvantage when delivering a full conventional war on equal terms. Now, sorry about this, I know my army's... <laughs> this second point I want to develop, and here I get into my, my, my mobilization question. This second point, on this unequal, uh, deployable, lethal violence, contains two important corollaries with major social implications. First, in order to make the transition to modern war, the DRV had to mobilize on an unprecedented social scale, and they had to do so in record time. What did they do? The government incorporated mandatory military service for the first time in mid-1949. Mandatory, obligatory, legally constituted military service began. They gotta go get the boys. They have to, in order to transform this guerrilla army into six divisions. 
meaning somewhere around 150,000 men uh, by the end of the war, maybe 200,000. They initiated a state of general mobilization in early 1950, which allowed the state to mobilize everything. Materials, people, porters, people who carry things, logistics, animals, boats, everything is what they say. And third example, they initiated, and I'll get back to this, full-scale land reform to induce the majority peasant population to fight in particular towards the end of the war, Dien Bien Phu, in order to bring down the French once and for all, in order to, 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 to uh, negotiate at Geneva in 1954. Second, in order to ensure that weapons, ammunition, medicines, and above all, food, reached tens of thousands of these soldiers going across northern Indochina to fight in eight set-piece battles between 1554, the Viet Minh needed a logistical system, a transport system. The problem was is that until uh, this point, as I said a moment ago, they had no mechanized transports, no trucks, planes, or ships. So what did they do? They had to rely disproportionately, disproportionately, excuse me, on human, animal, and ecological force. This meant drafting hundreds of thousands of civilians as porters. It meant requisitioning tens of thousands of bicycles, rafts, horses, and oxen, all the while pushing peasants to produce more rice in order to feed the growing, rapidly growing army and the phalanx of civilian porters. Do you see what's going on here? There's a huge problem if they want to make this transition. It just doesn't come about like magic. So there's a real discrepancy between the way people have written about the Vietnamese side of the war in my opinion, and what really people like Ho Chi Minh kind of at the directional level, and then all sorts of bureaucrats and officers, they got to get more food to this six divisions. You got to feed these guys. Huh? And you got to get that moving across wide expanses of northern Indochina. So this is where they're getting guys like this that you see here in my PowerPoint on the left hand side. People's logistics, and that's the word the Vietnamese use in Vietnamese. People's logistics and modern war, those are the two terms that they use in Vietnamese. Uh, so you have, in particular, the use of bicycles. I think you've seen this for the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The Ho Chi Minh Trail actually started during the, during the Indochina War. Guess when the Ho Chi Minh Trail really started to become the, the Ho Chi Minh Trail? 1950. It makes perfect sense. It came straight down from China uh, through the western side of the, 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 the Tonkin uh, Delta and then went to central Vietnam and be picked up in 1959. It didn't, wasn't created in 1959. It was created at this conjuncture. And this I can prove. So this gives you a few images of this people's logistics here about which I'm, I'm speaking. So this meant drafting hundreds of thousands of civilians as porters uh, and requisitioning tens of thousands of bicycles, as I said just a moment ago, while pushing peasants to produce uh, more rice to feed the army. As a result, the party's decision to fight a modern war on unequal logistical terms <laughs> meant it had to do so via the massive mobilization of manpower, similar, I think, to what the Soviets did during World War II to take on the Germans. This logistical mobilization, therefore, turned farmers, this fellow here on the left, turned, I don't know that, but I strongly, strongly suppose, uh, turned civilian farmers into soldiers uh, through the draft, of course, or it turned them into what was called lo logistical porters, and they were considered to be, obviously, part of the army. So they were militarized. This is a way of getting at the civilianization of war and the breakdown, obviously, of this barrier between civilians on the one side, combatants on the other. And this, then, is one example that I tried to give you of how the Indochina War became a much more totalizing one in terms of its social reach. That's the end of my second point with those two corollaries, okay? Let me just get to my third point, uh, which is this. As in China, North Korea, and the Soviet Union, communists were at the helm in Vietnam, in the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. 
And this mattered in several ways. Not only would the totalizing effects of the conflict expand horizontally, as you've seen here, across the society, uh, in terms of mobilizing everyone, soldiers and women and everything, but it would also become vertically totalizing as the parties sought, sought to take control of the state and the society from the top down. When the Vietnamese said total war in 49-50, they stressed the need for the party to take control of the state in order to organize all of this mobilization of which I spoke a moment ago. Only then, the Communist Corps argued as early as 1949, would the required level of massive and rapid socialization, uh, social mobilization be achievable. The party thus accelerated the recruiting and training of tens of thousands of cadres. This starts in 1949, 1950, 51, and especially in 1952. Uh, they started the recruiting and training of tens of thousands of cadres. That means a new generation of bureaucrats capable of controlling and mobilizing more effectively the state, the army, the economy, and the police force. Second, Vietnamese communists went further in what had now become one of the most violent conflicts of the Cold War. The communists initiated a class-based social revolution in the countryside in a double bid to mobilize peasants more effectively and to use the war to remake the state and the society in the communist image. What happened? They're going to institute Maoist-inspired land reform. On the one hand, it helps them to go further in the communization and the creation of a party society which controls theoretically. I'm not saying that happened. It's really interesting. It didn't. Um, but you can see what I'm saying is that they're trying to make this transition. And it's leading to the party trying to reach down as far as possible. They're also incorporating land reform in order to mobilize the peasants as much as possible because they are the ones who will make the army and make the logistics service work. So they're, in, in, they're incorporating the land reform, as the Chinese have done as well, in order to make this transition. So we have a military revolution on one hand, and we have a social revolution going on in a time of decolonization. They're also going to import Sino-Soviet mobilization techniques that were never used by the FLN or the Indonesian Republicans uh, in their wars against the Dutch and the French. I can come back to what they are, but rectification, emulation competitions, hero worship, cult of personality, and the increasing use of the police and security forces. These are all consolidated and developed from 1950 on. I'm not saying they established totalitarian control. I'm not even going to go down that road. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that the, transitional, the transition to conventional warfare was crucial to producing the party state, a state of war, capable of exerting at least increased and widening control over people in order to win this conventional war. But in so doing, the Vietnamese communists ensured that the war that they were now fighting, this new type of war, would turn their very state into something very different from a colonial graft. So this transition to conventional warfare was doubly totalizing in that it mobilized an ever-growing number of people. <coughs> and resources kind of horizontally, if you liked, all the while consolidating the party's hold over the state and society vertically. This didn't happen elsewhere, I submit, in the decolonizing South. Algerian and Indonesian nationalists fighting the French and Dutch never created divisional armies, to my knowledge. I'm not saying the Vietnamese is better. I'm saying this allows us to compare and say different things about different types of wars and different types of states and societies corresponding to them. That's all I'm saying. Nor did these other independence movement states achieve such an intense level of modern warfare or the social mobilization 
uh, and institutionalization it required. There was only one Dien Bien Phu in the history of 20th century wars of decolonization, and that was in northern Vietnam in 1954. There is no other Dien Bien Phu set piece battle, trench warfare, do you understand what I'm saying? In any other, in my, to my knowledge. How much time do I have? Uh, 10 minutes, 10, 12 minutes. I can do that. I think I can do that. I might just wrap up the, the concluding part a little bit faster. <coughs> just say a little bit more about these two types of totalizing, totalization that's going on. Uh, the horizontal one and the vertical one. I think the vertical one, the party state trying to reach down as low as you can go. You saw it here. This is land reform. This is when you denounce. It's a denouncing campaign. This is a typical Sino-Soviet technique which the Vietnamese used, and that's the landowner there. I can come back to that in the discussion if you like. I'm going to just say a few more words about this horizontal axis. I want to just give you some numbers. Uh, this mobilization of civilians occurred in northern Vietnam and much of central Vietnam with a total population for the DRV Vietnam of 7 million people in all. This mobilization hardly touched southern Vietnam. That came later. Let me give you one example, the conventional army. By late 1950, the DRV regular army numbered about 150,000 men. It's going to grow more, but it's going to stay at, you know, numbers around 200,000, mainly peasants. coming from central and northern Vietnam. This marked a widening of uh, the social makeup of the army dating from the early years of the war when it was mainly kind of an urban worker and a kind of bourgeois or kind of uh, urban affair. In all, possibly as many as 750,000 to a million men saw combat in the army between 1950 and 1954. Again, out of a total population of seven uh, seven million. But I gotta make stress something is that you have these two other armies of which I spoke a moment ago. Baudai's army is also a conventional army. They're not going to France to get their boys. They're not going to the Empire. They are the Empire. They're going and they are competing with the DRV for people on the ground. And this starts in 1950 and it goes all the way to 1975. And this scares the DRV terribly. So there is an increased competition for control over people because the Baudai army needs porters just as much as, maybe a little bit less, but they need porters as well for many of the same reasons of which I spoke a moment ago. These pictures here, I'm going to move a little bit if that's okay. The French army was never as modern as the American army during the Vietnam War. Now, the French army, was it more modern than the DRV? I can say that, and if you, I can give you examples, and I think that's provable. I don't have a problem with that. But that doesn't mean that they had this amazing sophistication and the industrial power that the Americans would have before. Which means that if you look carefully, and I have a student who's doing an MA on this, and it's absolutely fascinating what he's finding. If you look carefully, the French are also going to the ground looking for des bras, looking for people that they can use in their army for logistical reasons. And they're so desperate to get them, I can't give you the numbers here, but I'm sure it's over 200,000. They are so desperate to get people to help them logistically, they're so desperate to get civilians that they go and get them often illegally, or they are using prisoners of war, which was totally illegal as far as I know. We're in 1952, 53, and 54. What I'm saying here is you have something we can get to if it's right or wrong. That's a whole other kettle of fish. But what I am saying is that you can see that this is mobilizing people on an unprecedented level uh, in northern and central Vietnam. So here you have people, look, they have more modern, I guess if you don't mind me saying that, shovels. That obviously, I would bet my life that they come from the United States. Uh, it's not just weapons. I, 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 eventually, I'm going to be able to prove it. Anyway, it's a hypothesis. On the right-hand side here, <clears throat> those are women. So women and men are mobilized as well. And that's something I want to turn to now, is that on the DRV side, 
in and all, for these eight modern battles, or seven or eight, I can't remember, sorry, modern battles that occurred between 1950 and 1954, in all, the DRV state mobilized 1.7 million civilians out of a population of 7 million. Vietnamese say there was other ways that the civilians were mobilized. I tend to think that's probably true uh, in terms of uh, other things that they had to do uh, as opposed to just marching off to take things to the battlefront. Uh, so they tend to say that the number of civilians who are involved directly in this logistical military service was half of that 7 million. Of that 1.7 million, half of those civilian porters were women. Which means that between 1950 and 1954, we have a, excuse me, I almost went We have a very important feminization of war. So the army was all male. Women could not fight in the conventional army. But for reasons we can go back to them, but I think they're well known, women had to take over, and not just take over. They were playing key roles, but they were also being mobilized uh, in this increasingly dangerous war. Here's a few examples here. On the left, that's in the early stages, even obviously in the guerrilla war, there were men and women combined. There was no military draft. Everybody and everything, if you like. But it's increasingly going to be uh, women. So half of these mobilized porters and civilians were women. I'm going to stop here. I think I only have about five more minutes if that's okay. And I'm not going to really go into my text. I think I can, I can do it without, the, without doing that. I can cut it down here a little bit. But it's in French. I, I hope you can read it. The next one is two. But it's kind of, the other thing that I'm trying to do in this work in, in progress right now is to also think about the experience of war, how these civilians experienced and lived war. The porters that you, sing, mar that you see marching merrily and heroically along in the Vietnamese uh, propaganda photos down the Ho Chi Minh Trail were vulnerable. They were vulnerable now to airstrikes, and they would be until 1975. And here, please take the time to read this if you can, but it's an officer who's involved in the second major battle that occurred in 1951, who survived French bombing, supplied by the Americans, but he supplied a napalm bombing for the first time. If you look at the end there, he says, wow, he came back to his commanding officer, was that the nuclear bomb? No, that was napalm. Uh, so we have civilians who are more vulnerable, incredibly vulnerable, because no one has thought about how, how they, well, I mean, they did, but I mean, we're at the beginnings of this, and they don't have the modern means of doing it, uh, and so civilians are dying in very high numbers uh, during this, uh, this conventional type of warfare where the French have air power and the Vietnamese don't. The French have napalm and the Vietnamese don't. The Vietnamese can never bomb France, right? So, so it's a one-way impact on the civilians here. Another example is a female porter during the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. This is all written after the events, after 1954, but my idea here is to show you is that Civilians are in the line of fire. They're in the line of fire with the DRV. Here's a great example here with the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. They're in the line of fire with the French. Those prisoners, they often travel into battles with the French. Dien Bien Phu on the French side, they were captured by the Viet Minh. It wasn't just French and Empire soldiers, it was also those civilians you saw there who were shipped off as well to camps. <clears throat> it was incredibly brutal as an experience. Many of these civilians didn't want to fight. Many of them deserted. Many of them resisted. Many of them ran away. Some did, and they were very brave, and they were very proud of what they did, but they all did not. The reason I make that point is because if we should be impressed by what happened at DMV and Fu in 1954, 
when the colonized in the non-Western world defeated for the first time a modern Western army, uh, the French, uh, in that valley in the Northwest, we shouldn't forget perhaps one other thing, and that's this, is that the Vietnamese war state, this total state of war, I submit, also exhausted its people. It exhausted the civilians on whom this transition and this victory at the Indian Phu turned. And if you look closely at what happened during the Geneva Convention, the, the Geneva negotiations in 1954, if you look at what they're saying, Ho Chi Minh, Chen Cheng, the leaders, they're saying all sorts of things about the international level, but they're also saying we cannot rely. We cannot continue to exhaust our people. It's not sure that they can take it anymore. In other words, I submit as a hypothesis that this total state of war exhausted their very own people. And that is one of the key reasons, not the only reason, for which they had to stop the war in 1954. If I could just say one thing on kind of a document question to to kind of uh, end. There's one document in the last 10 years they published the new party documents in Vietnam. Very important source. But there's many things that have not been released in those documents. And one of the documents which has not been released, and I checked with my friends in, in the Communist Party, uh, very, very high placed, and they were involved in the creation of the, of the party documents as well. They can't tell me why, and even my friend doesn't know why. He wants to know why. The report given during the Geneva Conference, right before Ho Chi Minh and everybody signed on to uh, the Geneva Accord, ceasefire, actually, Vaughn Nguyen Zhao gave a report on the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. That report has not been published to this day. I suspect, just as a hypothesis, because sometimes as historians we can do this, I suspect it's the exhaustion of their people, which isn't a very heroic thing is high on that list. I could be wrong, but I want to see it. But I would remind you, too, that the Vietnamese are in no way unique in exhausting their people in order to win on the battlefield. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. Um, I will take questions, and I'll actually uh, reserve the right to ask the first one. I mean, <laughs> in 1916 or 8, in 1972, you have the same phenomena. Absolutely. And I can see that actually through East German and East European ah, no, documents. I mean, what do you see? Well, exactly, you know, that uh, in 72, March 72, there's an East uh, German uh, delegation visiting actually North <coughs> Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And they report that only women actually work in factories and they're so exhausted that they can work maybe four to five hours a day and then they go home. Yes, uh, so essentially now, the exhaustion is so big that civilian production, even of consumer goods, is starting to collapse. That's a very uh, I have a, I, have, I think I can't say it with some that's might be the corporate national history. Oh, look at that. It's there. So, um, so it seems to recur in cycles, 54, 68, and very good evidence, and 72 again, and then they're actually... Evolved. Well, 72 is, is very interesting, and again, uh, I'm not trying to go military history here, but what happened in 72, and it's very interesting that Jacques is back. I don't buy this idea that Jacques was somehow silent. It's much more complicated than that. Jacques is there. And he's the one who leads the, what's called the Easter Offensive in 1972. This is Dien Bien Phu number two. It's, it's that simple. And they get, they get clobbered. I think they get clobbered. I mean, they do do some other things, but I think that goes, you know, that confirms what you're saying. Yeah. Well, I think it's Dien Bien Phu three. True. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't but think so because... Different, different I, warfare, warfare, I understand that. Yeah. I don't think that they really committed the People's Army of Vietnam entirely to the South. But we can argue about that. We can argue about yeah. <laughs> that. No, my question is, you know, I'm interested about the rural reform. Obviously, the rural reform was uh, successful enough that the ERB did not lose the war. Um, but uh, I don't know. what kind of evidence do you have about the rural reform? Because we have quite good evidence now, all the evidence also about rural reform, uh, China. CCP in China, Yunnan, and Manchuria, 
and you have two different phenomena. One is that it didn't work, and the other phenomenon is that it actually was so successful. It was more than successful, and it assumed an inner dynamic, which then the, the party had to, to, to put the brake on, because otherwise they couldn't control the evolution. So what is the evidence you have? Just as, a, as my first question. I got a fudge on that, and it's because I'm, I'm asking the same question. I'm sorry. The reason I fudge is that we don't really have a good study of the land reform for the, the pre-54 period. We, we just don't have it. Um, we have the same argument on the Vietnamese side saying it was a failure, Bernard Fall and a lot of other people, and some who say that it, it, it was successful. Um, I, I think to some extent, I'm fudging again, I, I don't know, and that's why you could see I was careful in the way I was presenting it, but what I, I, what I was saying was that there was a desire to do it, to use the Maoist model. Um, I think from some of the evidence that I've seen is that it did work, and it did allow them to draw people in, because there was a lot of peasants who didn't want to die. They just simply didn't want to die, and nationalism, you know, I just don't buy that at all, at least for a lot of folks. So, I think it did. I have evidence. It's kind of memoirs that I'm using. I don't have archives, you know, but so I'm, I'm, I'm admittedly kind of fudging on that. Unless you have uh, really good information. Uh, please, I don't know if you, uh, did you have something? No, no, I, I, I have three people. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then you, <laughs> and then Okay, why don't you just do you to start? Okay, yeah, my question is, um, because you were focusing on the 50s, early 50s, uh, that time period. Uh, during that time period, we also had uh, conflicts in the uh, Korean Peninsula. Exactly. So they both happened at the same time in the context of the Cold War. Exactly. So my question is, uh, what is the status uh, or the role of uh, Vietnam in, uh, in, uh, for Mao and Stalin? And uh, compared to uh, uh, Korean Peninsula, and does that, if there is any difference, does that uh, difference explain the different uh, outcomes in these two regions? Uh, because for me, like these two regions are really similar, like uh, similar population, similar size, a similar position, and uh, right. uh, backwardness, and everything. History, colonialism, right. but the, the the outcome is so different, and so. Uh, why, why is the outcome different? Because they 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 decided to negotiate in 1953 and didn't keep on going. Uh, I mean, uh, so for example, like, uh, I'm not a historian, but right. what, what I see is that, so for example, after the war, uh, the Korean Peninsula split a state uh, as uh, two countries, but uh, they are Vietnamese and uh, they can unify the, uh, their country, and uh, so it, it's just confusing. So we're looking at this difference. Uh, are you uh, more looking into the international variables or domestic differences? I'm more on the ground on this. There's no doubt about it. I'm more interested in what's going on kind of between state and society. Uh, and of course, with the relationships to what's, you know, the type of aid and the type of support that's coming from the Chinese and to a certain extent the Soviets later on the one hand and the Americans for the French. Um, I mean, the, the question is why didn't, I mean, why didn't the North Koreans keep fighting? I mean, they could have, but I think if you look at the type of war which the Kim Il Sung fought, uh, it was very similar to the type of war, this conventional type of war. There was a very much a transition towards this type of war. So I would counter to you is that we, we need to think about, when we talk about different types of war in the non-Western world, or even just different types of war, I mean, I think we have a particular, a, not a peculiar, we have a certain type of war we can talk about in these communist-run states, you know, using these communist techniques and this mobilization. So Vietnam, North Korea, China for sure, they're both borrowing heavily from China, but of course China's borrowing from uh, the Soviet Union. The difference perhaps between China, Korea, and Vietnam is that you have a much lower level of industrialization. I mean, there was industrialization in the Soviet Union, but I mean, if you read some of the new stuff coming out on, on the Soviet Union during World War II, uh, the, the mobilization, at least from 1942 on, of the, of the peasant population is, is, is quite extraordinary. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? Uh, so I can't really answer your question, why didn't they keep on going, the North Koreans, after 54? I don't know. You've got to look at the Korean side and the North Korean side in particular. But before that period, I think we do have some similar type of, of, of phenomena. Uh, thanks for your talk. I'm a student from sociology department. Uh, I have a question about the legacies of the totalization process. 
So in China, the CCP has experienced the same situation, uh, the same condition. Uh, Absolutely. First, yeah, first at the uh, University of Wuhan, then in Korea. But uh, it seems that uh, the Chinese generals didn't uh, able to learn good lessons, gain good lessons from the transition. Uh, in the late 1950s, uh, the many generals attacked the uh, modernization program of the P uh, PRA. Uh, because they said they hate the uh, modernization. They think the uh, modern uh, military knowledge is too complicated for them. So then the PRA just uh, de uh, deviated from the modernization. I wonder whether the uh, same situation occurred to Vietnam after the revolution. Okay, I didn't quite, um, it's, it's, it's not you, it's me. I didn't quite understand, um, they used the land reform as well, obviously during the, against the Japanese and then during the Civil War. Uh, but the generals, you said that the Chinese generals didn't agree with what? I didn't quite understand the point that you wanted uh, to make. Yeah, uh, in, the, in the later period of the Civil War in Korea, uh, the Chinese army also got a lot of uh, modern weapons. Right. And uh, they, they suffered great losses when they confronted with uh, Americans. But right. uh, in the late 1950s, uh, the, C the CCP conducted a modernization program to modernize uh, the to modernize the, uh, the army. And all, can, all uh, high commanders are required to study in the military academy. But uh, uh, many of them <coughs> refused to do this. And uh, they said the Soviet uh, experience is too complicated to them. Uh, and they still stuck to the guerrilla war experience. So they very, uh, they very liked the civil war experience. Uh, so the modernization was blocked. Yes, I whether I'm following you perfectly. Happened. Yes, and this, this is, this is what some of my colleagues right now in Vietnamese studies don't get. They don't understand this. They, 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 they think a lot of this arguments about strategy that, that's going, there's a big debate right now on the Vietnam War. And it's coming from people working on the Vietnamese side and the Vietnamese archive. But they kind of think it's one man, Le Zuen, and, and, and in, he's, he's kind of a bad guy type thing. What they don't understand, in my opinion, is that there's, there is a, a, a huge debate which develops. Uh, on that very question of do we do guerrilla warfare or conventional warfare? I'm sorry. And, 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 and that is going to divide the Vietnamese party and I think it might be related to what you're talking about. At least that would be very interesting to know. I'm convinced that this debate that rips apart or rips the party to some extent in Vietnam in 1963 and then again in 1967 and then, well, it's, it's still there even in 1968 with the Tet Offensive, but Xia, the, the thing is, is that is this why I don't understand what's going on. Xia, at the beginning, wants to do only guerrilla war. He wants. It's not that they're afraid of war. It's it's it's, it's this question of strategy and what type of war they should do. And one of the things they're worried about is if we do conventional war, like Lazerman says, we're going to get wiped out. And they did. That is a very important point. Just a moment. Just also to that, 58 is of course the great leap forward, and the blocking of modernization of the army is related okay. actually to internal mobilization for the great leap forward. And the army is supposed to be actually the transmission, the vehicle actually it's of the mass mobilization. And this is imposed by Mao, who then of course has its own clients who then try to impose that against it. But actually, the military modernizes on the hand of fire, and of fire disappears also very quickly. So that's, that's very that is really, I mean, there is this connection between uh, modernization and mobilization, and it's actually, it's antithetical. That exactly. Even actually in China, it's very clear. Yeah. That might be I think this is what's going on. And you, you can bet your bottom dollar that the, that the Vietnamese were, were following this. They had to be. They had to be. And they were, these were very important debates. Because they had to always look at what the Chinese were doing as well. And they, I would love to know what's in the archives, obviously, in Vietnam, to get back to your question on Korea. They had to be following, you know, what was going on in Korea as well. Yeah, I was just, I'm interested in the, and I don't know if you, uh, address, if you address this directly, and maybe it's a Google for loss, uh, but I think the, I'm interested in the intersection of the conventional warfare strategy and the, the guerrilla war, and how those two things sort of interacted. So are you sort of saying that the total mobilization and the uh, pursuit of conventional warfare, in a sense, made the guerrilla warfare also more effective? That, I don't know, I mean, what I'm, I understand what you're saying. I, I, what, what, I'm, what, what I'm trying to say is that we have something really unique in China and in Korea, I think, and in Vietnam, in that 
these folks, they, they remain wedded to guerrilla warfare because they know it. And they, they, uh, but at the same time, they want to transition to conventional warfare. You understand what I'm saying? So I, I haven't, I guess you're right, I haven't looked at how, I have to some extent how it all hooks together. But what I can tell you is that the idea is we transition to conventional warfare, but at the same time, we maintain, we maintain guerrilla warfare. What I mean by that, you have to, I mean, the two things go together. So they're, they're using this to bog down the French in other places. They're using this to uh, diversionary tactics, all sorts of things. But they, you know, they, they keep it going at the same time. It's a, it's, a, it's a simultaneous type of thing. But I'm wondering if the, if the sort of, the focus on conventional warfare and the mobilization and the sort of professionalization of so many people had sort of uh, yeah. spillovers into the effectiveness of guerrilla warfare as well. I don't know. That's a, that's a really good question. It had to. That's what you guys are really good. It had to. <laughs> it, yeah, this is good. No, no. It, 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 it had to. I've never seen it like in the documents. Like, and this gets back to some of the other points that have been raised where Zop's saying, we got to stop this. You can't do both things at the same time. You know what I mean? It's like you can't have your cake and eat it. Uh, because uh, how can you know, or what they end up doing is, and this, I guess my answer is, they're going deeper and deeper into the society. They're digging deeper. They've got kids. They've got women. I know. I mean, they're, they're, uh, and, uh, and, you know, they're just running the people into the ground. Is basically what I'm saying. I mean, it's in, in order to win. Um, I think the Chinese. There's some other things that are that are going on here. The only difference is you got to remember Vietnam. The population is, and this is something else. Shot saying. I mean, he's, there's one point. It's like Mao saying or the Chinese. They're saying. Wave tactics, wave tactics. And he's like, wow, we can't do that. You see what I mean? We, we, we can't do that. It's a question of math. I mean, I've got the documents where basically Zhao's saying, we can't do it. It's math, guys. And the Chinese advisors, there, they're not like saying, oh, you know, they're like, oh, God, you're right. You know what I mean? The Chinese aren't idiots. They, they, they understand that you can't just transpose this model into Vietnam. I don't know what's going on in Korea, but it'd be fascinating. So there has to be interactions, Jake, and I don't really know what they are. I, I, I don't, all I know is that I have a lot of documents, but I really haven't looked at them with that sort of idea in mind. Thank you. But, um, I mean, it's, it's going on in northern Vietnam at the same time. But look at what's, if you compare this to Algeria, I mean, what happened in Algeria is what's happening in southern Vietnam during the Indochina War. But you don't have this desire to, to, to double it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Korea has been mentioned. I mean, in Korea, it's actually the Chinese that are fighting. Right? But there's nothing written on Korea. I mean, the 80s. Oh, well, Jeremy Brown has actually published about that stuff. Okay, I'm all ears. This is great. So, but but is he looking at this kind of mobilization well, stuff? Well, he looks actually who is fighting. And he okay. Has written about it. It's interesting. The first and the second days were actually from the Italians who then all deserved, you know, because they basically switched sides in the Chinese Civil War very late. Uh, but it's essentially, it, it is actually a conventional war. And the North Koreans really don't appear in the in, in the It's the Chinese, of course. And then it's really a matter of numbers, right? I mean, the Chinese have really numbers. I agree upon that. Right. What's the name of that author again? Jeremy Brown. Okay. Yes, that is a few. Okay, thank you. So I have a conceptual question. <laughs> um, you it's about the concept of total war and how you can maybe clarify it. Yeah. it um, so on the one hand, you want to say that uh, total war does not mean a war of all against all fighting each other. So right. it's, it's not uh, this kind of war of all against all. Um, at the same time, though, you don't have really a way to distinguish something like guerrilla war and conventional war. So on one reading, one might say, well, you know, if it's about the civilian uh, combatant blurring the, blurring of the distinction, guerrilla war does that. That's true. Right? So in some sense, then guerrilla war is seen as total well because we really don't have I agree. armed forces. I don't think that's what you want to say, though. Your whole uh, description of what's going on, the transformation of Vietnamese state and society towards a, basically a kind of modern account of total war. What that requires is basically something like um, concentration of state power, bureaucratic um, uniforms, uh, uniform rules, regulations, conscript armies, right? So in fact, you're talking about the modernization uh, of, of war, and it's, it's total in the sense that it requires uh, this kind of concentration, this ability of the state to penetrate, you know, to, like you say, take, you know, people 
people. And that's where I think the land reform matters because mm -hmm. um, what you needed, what the communists needed to do was basically, um, in some ways, to to uh, flatten power in society by taking True. away landlords, taking away little bureaucratic fiefdoms. The way they can do that is through land reform. True. They equalize, but that makes everybody weaker. This is the Tocqueville kind of thesis, right? right. Democracy in America. Absolutely. They make everybody individual weaker, unable to resist uh, basically the concentration of state power because in the end you still need society to be organized, you still need power to be located somewhere, but now it's located in the state. It provides for you on one hand, but it also now tells you what to do, right? This That's is, right. This is how equality turns into despotism under, you could say, uh, communism. Right. Um, so in some ways, I think you can explain then how uh, this kind of total war happens only in conditions of modernity. We I understand. have a bureaucratic centralized state capacity, which is being made at the same time that, so on the one hand, you need the, you know, the communist task is to create a, a modern state in Vietnam, which then allows them to fight a modern war. That's right. Is that basically? That is, that is. I mean, you said it much, much better than I did. Uh, that, 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 that's very much it, because I'm trying to show, too, that the, the, the state that comes out of this is not the state that went into it. This, right. this is not. Right. Well, I guess I was relying a lot on, on Charles Tilly to, to some extent. I probably should have. He's much better. Well, okay, okay, okay. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, I feel there's something there, but okay. <laughs> but that's, no, no, this is great. I'll, I'll definitely do that. Let me know maybe certain particular things I should read, but that's definitely where I, I, I want to go. Yeah, yeah um, that way you can distinguish what guerrilla war is, because a lot of people will think, well, it's just about the blurring. Well, that's what has happened war. to me in France right. when I gave a talk with my Rafael mm -hmm. Branch and mm -hmm. Sylvie Tenot, specialists of the Algerian War. And, and obviously, I agree with them that, well, this is guerrilla warfare. Now, of course, you can look at what happened in you know, Pol Pot, Cambodia, and you know, in Rwanda as well. I think Charlie Mara has said some interesting things about, you know, you can have unmodern wars which end up killing a hell of millions and millions of people. That's not quite where I'm going, and I think you got that right. And I didn't know you helped me get out of that, because I didn't quite know how to respond to those people. But it is true, my argument is that we have war making the state and the state making war. Right, right. But the people who are really taking the hits, it's the civilian population. But maybe I need to sort out kind of the different sort of things I want to discuss. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, in the beginning, you say that one of your goals, you want to sort of bring the focus back on the impact of war on That's civilians. That's right. And I talked about that less at the end. I tried to in those quotes, but yeah. Right. And I, I really appreciate that um, that attention. However, in, based on your presentation alone, um, one of the questions I had mm -hmm. is, so far your analysis has been done from a very top-down perspective, right. from perspective of uh, political leaders like Hong Jimin and so on, uh, and their strategy to mobilize civilians in order to win a war. True. Um, so what I'm missing is the other side. The other True. side from the perspective of civilians, why was mobilization successful? What about the tactics and way in which mobilization could, was conducted that uh, whether it was convincing to civilians and also even to problematize um, the issue of who civilians really are, because there's so many, even in civilians here, Absolutely. we refer to as one ethnic unit, right. but there are so many variations. I could agree more. Um, and the thing, bringing more of that perspective in will also have strengthened the argument. And the other point that I, something I have in mind in particular is the, um, the significance of Vietnam colonial history itself that has an impact on the civilian mindset. For example? Perhaps uh, just the fact that Vietnam has been has a very long colonial history. Um, over the beginning, being colonized for nearly a thousand years uh, mm -hmm. in China, and then a uh, very period of independence, and then recolonization again uh, under France, and, and so on. So one can argue that Vietnam, he, the modern state of Vietnam, uh, is not necessarily officially conceptualized until perhaps 1975, when the, the, the country has, would at that point, uh, fully unified under one yeah. party. Because yeah. even in 1945, it's a very important symbolic gesture Absolutely. that Vietnam is in the state at that point, because 
later in 54, is still a divided state. I agree. So therefore, um, that colonial history and the distinctiveness of that history, I think, has an important role in the way in which civilians are think about their motivation great. for participating in the war. That, that's great. Did your whole great comments? Thank you. I'm really going to, I take them to heart. I really do. That's great. I would say I did. I agree with what you say on different types of civilians. Um, you saw the women there a moment ago. One of the interesting things is that the, the Vietnamese state, uh, the war state, if you like, it was actually using. I'm, I'm going to try. I've got some statistics now that I have access to. Uh, it was mainly relying on non-Viet people. So the civilians actually were not Vietnamese, which is very interesting. I mean, we've known this, but that means the people doing the heavy lifting and the people dying. Not only were they well, not only were at least the, the logistics section, not only were they women, uh, but they were also minority people, so-called minority people who were uh, doing the lifting, literally, and dying. And they were also poor women uh, who were doing this. So also the people growing the rice. Um, I'm trying to work on a paper right now on children. I mean, this is, I mean, a lot of, I'm not the only, there's a lot of young in war history, there's people working on this, but it's quite clear that in particular in the guerrilla warfare side, and we can talk about that if you like, but there's, uh, the children are deeply involved uh, in, in warfare in Vietnam. Um, I have two questions. First of all, we've been talking about the relationships between conventional and guerrilla warfare, and I'm just wondering if either um, rhetorically in the political or in the civilian population, there's the sense that guerrilla warfare is the way that Communists in Asia fight oppressors or colonial war. I don't think so. I don't think so because, you know, we've got a lot of texts. That's the very thing. And you can see a lot of these texts that the Vietnamese, like others in the decolonizing world, are relying on all sorts of different sources. So you've got sources, obviously, in French and Vietnamese translation coming from the French, what the French were doing during the Second World War. That you even the the Chung Cheng is going to use the the idea too of guerrilla warfare, and, and that's coming oftentimes from the French. He could read French and Vietnamese, and even the idea of total war. But I don't know exactly. Anyway, but um, but also um, from from other sources, even from English, where there, there's a lot of different models. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, during that 45 to 50, and then boom, it's it's Maoism. Maoism's there. But then, bam, Maoism gets laid on because the Chinese are coming in with their advisors, and these are, you know, yada, 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 the Chinese advisors. But that 45 to 54, when that guerrilla stuff was being put together, even before, okay, a lot of folks were involved in China that were relying, but there's all sorts of other different models that are there, and all sorts of different discourses which are there. It's an absolutely fascinating topic, which, which you know, someone who has Vietnamese and a little bit of French, they could really have a great time with that. Sorry, What's the second one? My, my second question was, at the beginning, you were talking about how um, this case study and then conception of total war that you're putting forward can be extended to um, what you call the global south versus um, I, I guess total war in the Western world. I'm just wondering where you might okay, take that. Okay, you're good on that. Well, well, one of the things is I get a little bit, I gotta be honest, you know how it is all political scientists, historians, just human beings. We always get a little bit annoyed by someone who says something. It's like, I'm going to show them they're wrong. Now, <laughs> now, all I'm saying, I have, I have great respect for my, my colleagues. In the, there, there's, there's a big French school in, in France on, on World War I. And I, I love them dearly. I know them. And I'm not going to cite them. because, if you have, <laughs> But they have latched on to George Muss and cultural history in a big way. No problem there, I like cultural history as well, and I absolutely have been inspired by you know, what George Moss has done on masculinity and also on, on the idea of war, as I'm sure you've, you know, on, on um, the br brutalization of war, if you've read, you know, fallen soldiers and all that stuff, which, which is absolutely great stuff and I use it. But they have used this to create this idea of total war for the French First World War. And just everywhere in France, guerre totale, guerre totale, guerre totale, you know, totally forgetting that, you know, uh, so-called Anglo-Saxons have already worked on this for quite a while, and not even Anglo-Saxons, anyways, we won't go down that road, but I'm just saying that if you look closely at the First World War, at least I'm, I'm asking myself, were civilians in France and even Germany that mobilized? You understand, you see where I'm going with this? And I don't think so. 
I don't think so. Now, if you just if you define guilt total in a cultural sense, okay, well, here we go. Let's you know we we can do it. But if you define it in the terms that I try to set it out in, then there's a problem. There's you don't have this. I'm, I'm relying on Hugh Strand and on Talbot Emily again, and then you do not have this massive mobilization of the civilian population that's going on. Uh, you don't have 800,000 French women, you know, involved in in warfare. You see what I'm saying? You don't have a, I think I can prove ways that no, it's not at least as socially totalizing as you say it is in cultural terms. I'm just wondering, if you're looking at the numbers though, could that be a function of the population factor that you speak in? I don't know. My wife has put that question to me as well. Um, I mean, I, personally, I don't think so. I haven't really sat down to be honest with you. Uh, to compare the two, but I have tried to throw this out a little bit to get reaction from other people, you know, just because I think it'd be interesting not to contonate, not to limit our discussion of war just to, oh, here's the wars that happened in the global south, non-Western world, here's the ones that happened in World War II. I'm just saying it's a little Eurocentric, but it could be really interesting if we did find ways to compare it. Am I dodging your answer? Yes and no. My, my hypothesis is that I think I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also trying to provoke you and prove me I'm wrong. This is the only way we can move ahead. It's, it's the only way we got to because we got to. I, I just, I guess, I'm also got a kind of a, a desire to break Vietnam out of a Vietnamese shell and to kind of break France out of a Franco-centric, you know, style as well. I think it'd be interesting if we could say, let's compare the First World War one with the Indochina War. Why not? We have to define how we're doing it. I'm trying to spin out a few ideas. We're almost done and I have the last question. Uh, you mentioned very briefly at the beginning that you sort of want to move that project actually to 1975. Yeah. Ian, I don't know if this might be an old hat dream or you're realistic about that. That's not my question. Okay, good. Uh, my question is, you know, when you look at 75, uh, you know, is this really a state that demobilizes? Or is this actually a state because it's born actually in war? that is unable to demobilize after 75. And in fact, only demobilize as once the reform starts. That's exactly what I think. Yeah, and so this is actually really a, 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 war, a, a state, the ERD is a, is a state that is actually a, a state in permanent war for them. That's, that's my, that, I mean, I'm not, I'll cite you on that, but that's, that's my hypothesis. <laughs> but beyond 75. That's a total, that's why I use that title, Total State of War, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's incapable it's, it's a failure. It's, it's a, that's why, to get back to what you say, it's not as modern when you take out the war. That's what I'm, do you understand what I'm saying? It's, 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 it's quite good, kind of like China, and you know, using this modern mobilization and state building techniques that don't come from the West, that come through kind of these Sino-Soviet models and then are transplanted, and I think we need to know more about those type of things. But then it is not capable of modernizing itself after 1975. I think that's what you're saying, right? right? But it is a state conceived, born, and created in war. It is not. It is not like the FLN in 1962. It's, you know, it's not like Indonesia. And I'm not in any way belittling these. On the contrary, they got lucky, maybe. Well, the other thing is in 75 that mostly of it is actually also close to the south for seven years and then you engage actually in a new war in 78, 79. But, exactly, but they did that. They did that because I think it was the only thing they knew how to do to take control of the south. I think that's all they knew how to do. I think because they even knew in the north that this land reform, all this stuff is not working. We are not modern. We need to start doing like Deng Xiaoping is doing. You know, they, at least by 1979 they knew what was going on. You know. For those in China, you know, the Mao Dai 76, and then pretty quick the Chinese are going to start just shifting the whole tack the other way. And they knew that. They knew that. And they went ahead. But I think it's because they had to take control. They, had, they were scared, too, of what they, what they conquered. All right. We are unfortunately getting to the end, but you certainly can read our talk as the professor <laughs> goes <Yeah. laughs> You guys are good. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you all for your excellent questions. I really appreciate it. Questions, you can always send an email to uh, Christopher at the